Good morning and welcome to the Justice Committee's 16th meeting of 2019. There are no apologies. Agenda item one begins our first evidence panel at the start of our scrutiny of proposals to change the time period for the presumption against short sentences. I'm pleased to welcome the panel today, which comprises of Laura Hoskins, Head of Policy Community Justice Scotland, Colin McConnell, Chief Executive Scottish Prison Service, James Maybe, Highland Council, representing Social Work Scotland, and Kate Wallace, Chief Executive, Executive of Victim Support Scotland. I refer members to paper one, which is a public paper, and paper two, which is a private paper. And I'll kick off with a question to all the panellists. Um, if they could comment on the resource implications of the current short-term custodial sentences and community sentences alternative, and in terms of the implication for the a extension of a presumption against a 12-month sentence. So who would like to start with that? I, I'm happy to start. Um, in terms of the, the um, resources, um, what um, we've done at Community Justice Scotland is we, we've actually done um, an analysis and some research which we submitted with our evidence on um, the, the, the needs that people on current short-term sentences versus those who are on community sentences face. And, and what that clearly shows is that those who are, are currently serving short-term sentences have more needs across a whole range of issues, housing, financial, mental health, etc. Um, so we know that when they, when they, um, if, if pass was to happen, then the resource implications for, for, for those people would be greater should they be in the community. Um, but that in, in itself is not um, to suggest that they shouldn't be um, given community sentences, but only that, that um, more resources will be required. So, so we do know that there are different resource implications for those um, serving community sentences. In terms of um, current uh, community sentences, I don't have that information to hand, sorry. And in terms of the, the current resources um, available just now for um, short-term sentences? Um, I, I think that my colleague from Social Work Scotland perhaps could give some more information okay. on Thank that. Thank you. Yeah. Mr Maybe. Thank you. Based on the Scottish Government officials scenario planning, they're looking at a 7.5% increase potentially in community payback orders if the presumption against short-term sentences is extended. And I think that, that does bring great challenges for community-based uh, services. Um, going back to when community payback orders were introduced in 2011, um, since then I think I'm right in saying that the Scottish Prison Service have had an increase in funding of about 8.9%. For criminal justice social work, the core grant has remained static at £86.5 million per annum. Now, if we were to get an extra 8.9%, that would raise it by something like 7.6, 7.7 million. So I think that's in indicative of the fact that there has been resources in one part of the system, but a lack of injection of resources in the other part of the system. Now, as it set out in the Social Work Scotland response, that, that Scottish Government have made some resources available to assist criminal justice social work to prepare for the presumption against short-term sentences. But I think it's very much catch up. A lot of those resources are going into trying to maintain the status quo rather than actually building new capacity. Um, a number of authorities uh, and one or two who've submitted responses to the committee are still receiving support from their local authorities in addition to the Section 27 core grant for criminal justice social work. Um, and that is simply in order to sustain um, services at the current level. If I could maybe draw um, a footballing analogy if you've only got 10 players, it doesn't matter how tactically astute you are, how brilliant you are as a manager, um, you're going to find it difficult. Um, your team might score a goal against the run of play, but the players will become tired, they will become demoralised, inevitably they will probably lose the game. And I think that very much is a feeling in criminal justice social work, that we are running to stand still at the moment in terms of the demands on the service um, and the complexity of the work that we're doing. And I think the, the work that Community Justice Scotland um, have done very recently, looking at that, that um, prison population um, up to 12 months and the anticipation that if some of those individuals do come onto 
community sentences. They will bring with them much more complex needs, particularly around mental health, for example, um, and other services. And there's very much a ripple effect here. Um, yes, criminal justice, social work need to be resourced to do this, but so do a whole range of other agencies in the community. Um, you know, the ripple starts at the court stage when a, when a report is made, but once somebody's onto an order, there's a whole range of statutory and third sector agencies who do require the resources to provide uh, the input in the community. And I'll particularly make, make reference to the women's um, population in prison. Um, I think it's quite a staggering figure that 90% um, in 2017-18 um, of women receiving a custodial sentence were less than 12 months. I think that, that's a really interesting um, piece of information. And if, if some of those individuals find their way onto community payback, which we would very much hope, they will bring them very complex issues. Uh, we know that, that women often have greater adverse childhood experiences, for example. Um, they're often victims and, and domestic abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we do need to make sure that we have the resources to be able to deliver um, pass if it is extended. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, uh, other panel members? Okay. I think um, from victims' perspective, they want to have um, yes. confidence in the criminal justice system and confidence that nobody else is going to be in the situation that they've found themselves in. So that means putting enough resource behind community payback orders. And we were very interested, for example, in um, Social Work Scotland's evidence um, to say <coughs> that these orders need to be heavily resourced from a social work point of view. They also need to be targeting the offending behaviour and the underlying causes of it as um, Community Justice Scotland have said. Um, so, for example, targeted programmes, a couple that spring to mind around stalking, for example, um, and let, you know, Susie Lamplew Trust have found that unless there are targeted interventions around that fixated and obsessive behaviour, then anything that is done is unlikely to be um, successful in terms of um, helping that perpetrator to stop um, re-offending. So we would echo what has been said about resource and to make sure that um, if we are going to go down this road that community payback orders are as um, well resourced as possible to be as effective as possible. Um, otherwise, um, re-offending will continue um, and victims will not have confidence in the justice system um, at all. Thank you. And Mr McConnell. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, <clears throat> there's a couple of uh, points being made uh, about SPS's resources, which I'll, I'll address uh, in due course. But I think to answer your, your overall uh, or respond to your overall question as a sort of starting point, I think the resourcing of the, the system uh, in general needs needs careful uh, consideration. Um, you know the churn uh, of mm -hmm. people who are um, you know, given short sentences in this case, uh, sentences to um, under 12 months is considerable. Uh, so the um, you know the stock today uh, I was checking before I, I left the office. We've got 1,049 people in our care today. So that's that's the stock, yeah. but of course the churn uh, on on that is is quite quite considerable. So that takes up a, a lot of front end uh, resource through reception, through settling people into their period of custody. And I think if you're looking at that from a value for money perspective, I think you seriously got got to question that because, of course, someone being um, you're know, sentenced to a relatively short period of custody, we would reasonably only expect them to serve half of that. Uh, so while someone might get five or six months in custody, in reality, they're, they're, they're serving but a few weeks. So I think it's right that we reflect on whether that's, that's value for money. And I think that then takes us into the overall effectiveness of uh, short-term prison sentences compared to um, community payback orders or, or other, other sentences that might, might yet be uh, developed or, or implemented in the community. So I think, I think from a custodial perspective, I, I would certainly welcome the, the scrutiny that's, that's being uh, applied. I think that has to be put in context, though, the general upward uh, trend of the numbers of people being sent to custody. You know, this is a system that's designed and resourced for 7669. That's what we are uh, designed and resourced for. Uh, this morning, we have 8,242 uh, people uh, living with us. So that's the equivalent of a large prison, really, uh, 
too many people uh, living with us on a day-to-day -day basis, and actually uh, not enough resource uh, to look at them. I was. You'll forgive me, but I was a slightly surprised uh, at James's uh, analysis of our uh, financial uh, situation. But it's actually a matter of public record. If you look um, in the public domain at our corporate plan that's just been published, it actually records uh, that over the last five years, SPS has been subjected to either flat cash or, in fact, uh, cash cuts. And I think we need to, just so I can respond to that properly, um, separate out that which is cash or running costs and that which is capital. And it's the, the running cost side in particular of the custodial service that has been driven down year on year on year. So I think we have to be careful and, and not be attracted to this notion that somehow we have a Scottish prison service that's absolutely awash with cash and that only if we could take out a few hundred people, then there are millions and millions of pounds that can then be redirected uh, to the community space. I go back to the point I made initially. I think the system needs properly reviewed so that funding gets put in place to support where the right solutions uh, can consider to be more effective. And it shouldn't be considered as a binary. It's either this or it's, either or, or it's that. I think the system needs to be properly resourced as a whole. Okay, that's very helpful. Um, setting the the background or um, the scene for uh, further questions. John, you've got a supplementary. Yeah. Thank you very much, convener. Good morning, panel. So, uh, it's a question for Mr. Maybe. You, you mentioned, Mr. Maybe, a, a specific sum coming from the Scottish government, as I understood, for criminal justice social work. Is that ring fenced exclusively for criminal justice social work? Um, is there a distinct budget within local authorities for that, or if there are? cuts, for want of a better phrase, to come? Do they come across the board in, in social work departments in each of the local authorities? Please. The Section 27 grants, is, is what it's usually referred to, is ring-fenced. Um, so the money goes to local authorities, is ring-fenced, and therefore is protected only for criminal justice social work. However, I think it's fair to say that, given the pressures on local authorities in the broader sense, that that does have an impact on criminal justice social work in terms of all the other services that um, local authorities provide, be that housing, be that children and families, social work, adult social work. So we're not protected from that, but yes, the money we receive from Scottish Government is ring-fenced. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I, I'd just like to test and probe the, the, the logic of the proposition that we, we have in front of us. And I think in some ways it stems very much from what, what, what Colin McConnell just said. So we, we have a cohort of people that seem to be essentially repeat customers of the, the Scottish Prison Service uh, with recidivism uh, rates of around 50% for, 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 for short sentences. Uh, 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 is that the, you know, I, I'm just wondering, first of all, if the panel would agree that that, that is a, in a nutshell what the, 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 the issue is, or if there are other uh, elements that, that, that we need to be considering in terms of the, the, the problem that we're seeking to, to uh, solve here. If I could possibly respond on, um, initially, I mean, I think, um, I think the evidence would suggest that those given a custodial sentence of under a year are reconvicted almost twice as much as somebody who's given a community payback order. Um, th there is an issue there in terms of matching the two populations. They don't obviously match up completely, um, but I think uh, the academics and the research evidence would suggest that uh, if those individuals were put on community payback, um, they're less likely to, to, to re-offend and be reconvicted. Um, so I think that, that's generally accepted um, within the criminal justice world. Um, I don't know if my colleagues would, would agree or disagree with that. Um, and uh, just a, another figure, short custodial sentences of high reconviction rates of so those released from a custodial sentence of one year or less 51% are reconvicted within a year, 35% are back in prison within a year. Um, so I think it, it does touch on Colin McConnell's point about resourcing, and, and I wasn't suggesting for a moment that Scottish Prison Service are, are awash with cash. I don't think they are. Uh, and I was quoting a figure in the Howard League of Penal Reforms um, submission in, in respect to that 8.9%. Eight um, but I think there is an issue about people going into prison for very short sentences, as has been outlined. And with the best will in the world, the Scottish Prison Service 
cannot provide a full range of services to, the, to those individuals. Um, I, I was, was sent by colleagues in SACRO um, a short clip from a, a TV report at the last couple of weeks around the presumption of short-term sentences. Um, and there was an individual who had been in and out of prison for nine or ten years, um, and he was saying that for the first time he's now getting the support through SACRO, um, and he's made more progress in the eight or nine months he's had that input in the community than in the whole time he was in prison. Um, now that's one individual, but I'm not sure that, that he, he's alone um, in, in, in having that, that particular view. I think, sorry, just to highlight that the um, data that um, James is discussing is around reconviction. Um, there's actually Social Work Scotland saying their own written evidence, as you've probably seen, that the evidence around reoffending um, and the impact on that from community payback orders is a lot more contested. It's not as straightforward. Um, so there is a difference between reoffending and reconviction, and obviously um, a very, very small number of people who um, are who are charged and arrested actually then go on to be convicted. So I think that's worth bearing in mind. It's by no means as straightforward. Um, is saying that, re that community payback orders are absolutely reducing reoffending rates. Um, the data is, does not support that at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, I, I also think there's an issue around the, the, the problems that we create by sending people to prison on short-term sentences, particularly in relation to um, home housing accommodation needs. Um, we mentioned in our evidence the fact that when people leaving prison are, are much more likely to, to have problems with um, finding accommodation. Um, we're, we're, we're actually creating new problems for some people by, by taking them away from their employment, their tenancies, etc. Um, we also highlighted the Child Poverty Action Group research in terms of people's um, legacy benefits under universal credit, whereby if they go into prison, they lose their existing um, thresholds on, on that benefit. When they come out, they make a new claim and they're given the, the lower rate. So it, it makes a, a bad financial situation even worse for them. So I think by, by sending people to prison for very short term periods, we're actually creating a lot of additional social problems for them in the longer term. Uh, yeah, I would, um, in, indeed, I would certainly agree uh, with with all of what's what's been said. I mean, my, my my position is I I really don't believe that in any way uh, those on the Shrievel benches um, uh, sort of knee jerk into sending people to prison. And I think much as the um, proposal is is crafted in the sense that it's it's a presumption against rather than a prohibition. Uh, I think it's, it's right that uh, it is predominantly sheriffs, um, that sheriffs uh, are left unfettered um, but guided uh, in terms of how their, their decisions um, affect the individuals that, that are in front of them. So, I mean, I was just checking this morning in terms of the presumption against uh, sentences of three months or less. And there are 55 uh, people in our care today uh, serving sentences of less than, than three months. So I think that gives us some insight into how this could play out uh, in the future, that you know, um, sheriffs may well uh, decide for those, those that are in front of them that, for their reasons, uh, that prison remains for them the appropriate, not, not the issue of last resort, but the appropriate decision. But we have to be absolutely clear that people coming into prison custody in Scotland for very, very short periods of time, um, there is little opportunity effectively to do anything that is in any way intended to change the, the, um, the criminogenics, if you like, that lie behind why, why someone might, might be uh, committing particular uh, forms of offences. There just is not enough time uh, to do that. Yeah. And really what that... <clears throat> that short period uh, has to simply focus on is the administrative process of taking someone into custody and beyond that, stabilising them in terms of their condition and their situation for that very short period of time. So therefore, perhaps we shouldn't be overly surprised that when someone is sent to custody for a very short period of time, that actually their offending behaviour doesn't really alter that much. On the other side, if I, if I may just take another 60 seconds, I suppose it does take us into the realms of 
you know, what the sentence is for, mm -hmm. and how much of that is deterrence, how much of it is about rehabilitation, and how much of it is aimed ostensibly to punish, and it might well be, and I don't know because I, I don't sit on the shrivel benches, that there may well just simply be an intention, uh, although well intended, that a short sentence <coughs> is simply uh, a, an indication or a way to punish someone for a wrong done, but because of the short period of time, um, there's, there's little in the way of reformative engagement that can take place. Um, I think the points you've just made there, uh, Ms. McConnell, I think are particularly relevant. I think one of my concerns, I mean, I, and I broadly agree with the, the analysis that we need to do something about re reducing the number, the cohort of people who just seem to be in the revolving door. And I also would agree with the, the question of the assumption of whether or not prison is the, the right or, or the best place to deal with those people. However, I, I do worry that perhaps that, that essentially drawing an arbitrary time limit doesn't really look at the underlying causes, especially if you look at some jurisdictions, such as Norway, which takes a progressive approach. Its typical sentence is three to six months. And if you look at what you just said there, we don't have enough time. I would question whether if someone is in your care for two or three months, is it the fact that that's not enough time? Or is it actually the, rather that there are insufficient resources to actually engage with that person adequately? I mean, we know that you direct more of your resources towards long-term prisoners rather than medium and short-term prisoners. That's just a, a fact. I, I wonder whether or not really what we should be looking at is what people do when they're in prison and making sure that's as effective as possible rather than looking at an arbitrary time limit. And I'm slightly playing devil's advocate here, but, but have we put the cart before the horse and looking at a, a time base rather than the effectiveness of what actually occurs when people are incarcerated? Um, that's that's a hard logic to, uh, to unpick or to, to argue uh, against. Um, I, th I, th I think it is, uh, regardless of which jurisdiction uh, we, we, we consider, certainly in the UK, and as you know, I've worked in all three uh, UK uh, jurisdictions, and my, my observations and my experience would remain consistent uh, across those three jurisdictions. It's incredibly difficult um, to engage transformatively um, with someone o over a number of weeks, as opposed to many, many months, or for that matter, uh, years, in terms of building trust, uh, other more informed cognitive programs, for example, having time to, to influence and, and have effect. All these things <coughs> take time. But if I may respond directly to your challenge about resources, um, it, it would seem um, entirely consistent in terms of what you've uh, put forward that you know, we're, we're, we're a system this morning with 8,242 people living with us. Uh, the resource base for the system is 7669. Um, so uh, again, I, I, I agree with your, your analysis that within that context, it's extraordinarily difficult um, to focus <coughs> progressively on 8,200 people at a time when um, a thousand of them are with us but a matter of weeks. I'd just like to put one final question to, to, to Laura Hoskins. I and mean, I think Colonel Justice Scotland have, have set out well what the, the alternative is. The alternative is available to, to sentences right now. And, and if we work on the assumption that sentences don't like people returning to their courtroom, the question then is why aren't they using those alternatives now? Are sentences, in, in effect, over reliant on prison sentences? Or is there something else going on in terms of th those, those alternatives available to them? Um, well, I can't actually speak for the judiciary in terms of how, how they make their decisions, but I mean, it has been said that um, <coughs> sentencers and victims need confidence in, in a robust community um, provision, and that the issue may be um, one of the lack of confidence on what's available locally. I think SACRO mentioned in their submission um, the issue around the very short-term funding cycles for um, support for third sector agencies in particular to deliver good um, community provision on the ground. And so I think, again, we get back into the discussion around resources. I think 
we do need to make the community provision more robust. I think looking at um, slightly longer fin funding circle cycles would be a really good start. Um, and, and then I think we, we would potentially see a shift. It's really interesting in some parts of the country, I think Clats Council mentioned their submission, Alloa Sheriff Court, there's almost a de facto 12 month pass in operation. Very, very few um, cases um, don't go to the community. So I think there is different behaviours around the country. There are also some really good examples of um, structured deferred sentences working in, in Lanarkshire Court. So, so there are good models around, but, but we probably do need to invest more in them. So we're, we're picking up again on that resourcing issue. And that's not necessarily just for criminal justice social work. It could be for the, the third sector, and not just even in the justice field, but maybe in the, in the broader housing, mental health, other areas as well. Great. I think I should pass on to a colleague at this point. Okay. Um, a supplementary on your own question, uh, Fulton, and then Liam Kerr, I think you've got a supplementary. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Convener. Uh, good morning, panel. It was, it's quite a specific question on the back of uh, Daniel Johnson's uh, line of questioning there and probably picks up a wee bit on the, the structured um, deferred sentence that you were talking about there, uh, Laura Hopkins. I, I'm, I'm wondering if the panel could comment on the direct interplay between um, community payback orders and short-term sentences, for example. Uh, if perhaps somebody is on a community payback order, and I believe that's not to be too uncommon, the example I'm giving, somebody is on a community payback order, and then they are later given a short-term custodial sentence for a completely unrelated matter. Would you be able to comment on that, perhaps yourself, Lauren, and James, maybe? That's if I could respond. Um, certainly, on occasions, people do go into prison and come back out, and they're still subject to the same community payback order. That certainly does, does happen. Um, I can't comment uh, right here, right now, on how widely that happens. Um, I suspect it's not that wide, um, but I would need to, to go in and check that one out. Totally, <clears throat> yes, but um, I don't have any um, data to, um, to, re to support that. Um, I, I think there probably is a need for um, more research on the reasons for non-compliance with CPOs, because there is that kind of suggestion that eventually a short-term sentence is the answer to the, the repeat um, attendance at court. So, um, but we probably need to do some more research on the reasons for that. So, so, so I probably didn't um, put that question particularly well. If I, could if I could reframe it in, a, in another type of example, if, if perhaps somebody's doing really well on a community payback order, but they are, but they, um, they are in court for a totally separate matter, um, I, I was more wondering about the interplay between that. So, whether you know, if community pay, the, the impact basically on community payback orders of short-term sentences when somebody is already serving a community payback order? I think clearly if, if somebody is on a community payback order and they've established a good relationship with their social worker and they're engaging in work and then they find themselves in prison, clearly that would interrupt um, that course of work. I think one of the things we do, no, do know from academics is that one of the really important things in terms of making a difference with people is that relationship that the individual has with their social worker. Um, and again, picking up the short-term sentences, Scottish Prison Service staff don't have an opportunity to develop that longer-term relationship. So any, any interruption to that um, can be problematic and potentially um, be a backward step. I think the issue of non-compliance is, is a relevant one, and I think I suspect it's something that, that sheriffs struggle with um, if they're getting the same individual back time and time again. Um, but I think non-compliance can be willful, um, or it can be quite complex in terms of why somebody is not turning up for an appointment or engaging as well as they could be. It could be because they've got a whole range of issues they're trying to deal with, mental health, <coughs> homelessness, housing, um, benefits, et cetera, et cetera. And I think we do need to think about how we work better to support individuals who are struggling. Um, there is a commitment there. They want to engage, they want to change, they want to move forward with their lives but they actually need quite intensive work. A number of areas, um, Glasgow being one, for example, have a persistent offenders project um, we do in Highland. Often individuals engaged with that have got multiple offences, uh, convictions. Often they're not engaged with services, they're not on statutory supervision. 
but they're getting the intensity of input, people who can see them several times a week, to actually really engage with them, get them linked into services, get them re-engaged back with, with what's going on in their, in their community. So I do think we need to give some thought to that, particularly if PASS does go ahead and the extension is, is um, taken up to 12 months. Um, we're likely to get people who, who are going to need that kind of input um, to help with the community payback. And we know through services for prisoners coming out on release, through Shine, for example, through Sacro, through New Roots, or Action for Children, who are providing really good, high-quality mentoring services, that that can make a difference to somebody actually walking through a prison gate. And we need to think about that from somebody walking from, from a court, that they're getting that really intensive support. And just to add to the point about um, non-compliance, if I may, at the moment, um, victims don't get any information at all um, about um, what's happened with a perpetrator where there's been a community payback order um, given. And even a victim knowing that someone has successfully engaged with a community payback order and has successfully completed it, um, I think would help in terms of the point um, around having confidence in the justice system um, and um, having an understanding about that what's happened to them um, is not going to happen to anybody else. So I would just make that point too. Mr McConnell. Uh, thanks, Kavina. Um, yeah, again, I, I agree with everything that's, that's been said by, by the other uh, panel members. And I think actually what's, what's coming out here is, uh, in, in some sense, it sort of challenges the, the sort of raw financial comparisons between the cost of a short-term prison sentence <laughs> and the cost of keeping someone in the community. I think it would be wrong uh, for the committee, or more generally, to think that by keeping people in the community, this somehow is going to be a cheap option, or cheap air option. I fundamentally challenge that from everything <coughs> that's, that's been said. Um, it would seem the, the, the way forward, if indeed um, this, this becomes you know, part, part of our uh, justice infrastructure, and I certainly hope it does. Um, this, this will require um, substantial financial and other resources, skills, competencies right across uh, the system, uh, whether it's in the statutory services or, for that matter, uh, in the third and voluntary uh, sector. So I think over time uh, this, this, this will cause us to probably I think, spend a lot more uh, on the justice system, perhaps not a lot less. And it's important that, again, we don't see this as, as some way of reducing the cost of the system, because quite clearly it will require significant investment over a sustained period of time. Sorry, Ms. Mr. Just to come back on that point, because I think it's a really important one. It's almost a spend to save here. If you look at the evaluation that was done of the Glasgow Persistent Offenders Project in the 2000s, and also the evaluation we've done locally in, in Highland of our project, we were actually able to demonstrate significant cost savings um, to the justice sector system. And I think that that's a really important point to make, that yes, there might well be very high upfront costs to do this properly, but if we do, further down the line, there will be uh, we'll be able to recoup that cost, I think. And I think that's a really important point. Because I, I appreciate that, um, that, that, that this will be my, my only line of questioning. Based on what's been said there about the, the investment needed in, in community resources to make it work, rather than looking at it uh, as a advantages of community sentences over short custodial sentences, rather than looking at it in that line, does the panel think that the introduction of the presumption against short custodial sentences could, in the wider scheme of things, enhance the effectiveness of community payback orders? Who would like to answer that? If resources are, as, as you've mentioned. <laughs> the outcomes for the individual would, would, would be better. So, yes. Yeah. I think so. I think if, if the resources are there, then, then I, I think um, there would be benefit. And I think there would be benefit for victims as well. Because um, what we're all trying to achieve is to stop people reoffending or being reconvicted um, and, and causing harm. And certainly, Social Work Scotland very much of the view um, that prison should be. Re There's a place for prison in the sentencing framework, of course, there is, but it should be restricted for those who are causing serious offences, um, who are at the highest risk of causing serious harm. I think I'm right in saying that 80% 
um, <coughs> if people get 12 months or less in terms of the, the sentence they get in court. So we can make a, a real difference with, with that group, I think, um, if we have the resources and we have the, the synergy between the various parts of the system. And my colleague mentioned um, diversion and structured deferred sentences, and I don't think we should f forget those um, because they're a potential implication as well. If, if fiscals are making different decisions, if sheriffs are making different decisions in court, um, that, that again may be a cost implication, resource implication for services in the community. Okay. Um, anyone else? Kate. Just to say from, um, um, from a victim's perspective, um, a couple of things. One of them is about the safety of the public and the safety about victims. Um, and I think um, your point um, that you made about um, effectiveness um, of a criminal justice system overall is obviously what victims are looking for. And it's not just about resources, I think, in terms of community payback orders, but about the effectiveness of those, the targeted nature, as I, as I mentioned earlier on, around um, tackling some of the offending behaviour. But also just to highlight that we are already, um, for some types of offences in some situations, we're already using community payback orders where there have been pretty serious offences being committed, um, some resulting in death and some resulting in quite serious injury. Um, so, for example, the Scottish campaign against the responsible drive in their um, evidence to you. Um, talked about a case study of an unlicensed driver who pled guilty to causing death of three teenagers while careless driving. He was given 300 hours of a community sentence. Um, so I think just in the context of what you've described around an effective um, justice system in the whole, we need to remember about um, the safety of um, victims and about the effectiveness of interventions as a whole to, um, to reduce offending. Um, there are some victim organisations who are called calling for the presumption against short sentences only to be used um, where there has been no um, either physical or psychological harm um, to an, an, a victim um, because of those reasons that I've just illustrated. Okay, thank you. Supplementary Liam Kerr and then we're moving on to Rona. Thank you, convener. Uh, I'd like to go back to Daniel Johnson's line of questioning to Mr McConnell, if I may. Uh, I think, uh, Mr McConnell, you made some good points in there about the stabilisation at the start, uh, or the challenges around stabilisation. Um, given that, I think the last statistic said that 60% of drug treatment and testing orders out in the community are not completed, uh, may I have your thoughts on the argument that actually a, a short period in your care uh, actually does give an opportunity for some very targeted, uh, very um, effective work to be done with uh, perhaps the chaotic population that I think you alluded to? Yeah, indeed, I think um, if, if I may sort of relate the answer back to um, the discussion we had about resourcing, it, it, it simply can't be an either or. Um, and, you know, I think the proposal as it's, as it's currently crafted does leave uh, sheriffs with, you know, the option to, to send someone to, to custody um, for a short period of time, so long as the sheriff has, um, had good, has good reason uh, to do that, and those, those reasons are, are explained. Um, I think whether, whether it's, a, you know, a, a fashionable uh, reality or not, um, prison can be, uh, in some circumstances and for some people, a place of safety, uh, particularly for those who are leading just fantastically chaotic uh, lives, who may well be, um, you know, with, without an abode, uh, not registered with a GP, so on uh, and so forth. Um, and again, whether it's fashionable or comfortable or not, uh, prison for all its foibles and its weaknesses, um, a, a prison space for a period of time can bring with it stability uh, in terms of somewhere warm and dry to sleep, three meals a day, medical attention, so on uh, and so forth. I still make the point, however, uh, that, um, that, you know, that, that uh, reality even in itself, begins to lose much of its attraction or its effectiveness if the period is particularly short. And, you know, really placing someone uh, with us, 
you know, for, for a couple of weeks or so. Even, even in that regard, I, I think, is um, a wee bit on the negative uh, side. But I think the point you make is, is absolutely uh, right. Uh, for some people, that, that could persuasively be the right thing to do. But broadly, I think the discussion that's been had around here uh, is, is the right one, which is there are far more positives uh, in terms of trying to keep people out of custody in a well-resourced and well-structured community setting, and that I think that is <coughs> important. Um, I, I think you make um, good points on that, and uh, I'd just like to stay on that short period, but I do take your point about the very short period, the kind of two weeks or whatever, but Daniel Johnson talked again about the using the short period productively. Uh, I think I'm right in saying that the purposeful activity that goes on in prisons is currently at a very low level. I think it's its lowest since about 2010, 2011. Uh, now, I'd be interested to know if that's a resourcing issue, uh, if that's a decision that's been taken, and, and if so, is it about putting more resources in? But again, I go back to the point that I think Daniel was getting at, that isn't there a window where actually if we put in purposeful activity, even for uh, not a terrifically short sentence, but a short sentence, uh, that that actually has a, a value that perhaps a CPO can't deliver? Um, I think that's a hard one for me to call. Was that I'm not sure necessarily we're, we're comparing apples uh, with apples there. I, I, I can answer for the custodial uh, space. I mean, the, the, the prison setting, as, as all the committee members will know, is, is actually a really complex interplay of a whole range of issues. So, you know, we've 8,242 individuals uh, living with us today, and actually each one of them would benefit from a highly, highly specialised, highly individualised uh, uh, service um, provision. That's the ideal, but it's not, it's not always possible when you're, you're trying to look after that many people. I think it goes back to you know, the fact that we have a prison system, and this isn't just Scotland, I'd say the same uh, for the rest of the UK, which fundamentally is still born out of the Victorian era. Um, which essentially was, was, was about calm, quiet incarceration uh, and contemplation and reflectiveness. And then as, as a sort of a modern era has built on that, then we've introduced education, we've introduced works and skills. But these have been add-ons, really, to what is still fundamentally um, a system based on accommodation. So I think you know, we, we, we do have limited opportunities uh, to provide full employment or full education or a full wraparound service. I think we are much, much better at it. And you would expect me to say this, wouldn't you? Um, I, think, I think Scotland is ahead of the game as far as the UK uh, is, is concerned. I've, I've worked in all, all three jurisdictions. But I think that we have to be realistic about the capacity of the prison service to be everything to everybody. It simply can't be. And fundamentally, it's still based on safe accommodation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Rona. Thank you. Good morning. Um, yes, before my main question, I just wanted to um, go back to something uh, Mr McConnell said, and it was about the, the drop in number of people being uh, receiving sentences of three months or less. Um, there's evidence of some up-tariffing, up so some are getting four or five, six. So would you agree that the presumption against uh, 12 months would mitigate that? That's, that's a hard one to call. Um, I mean, Justice Analytical Services uh, has done some analysis that I, I, I believe that the committee's uh, already got the data on that in terms of what the likely or the potential impact yeah. of uh, a, a presumption against uh, sentences of, of less than 12 months is. And, you know, it's, it's set out um, here in 10, 20 or, or 50 per cent. I think the evidence uh, based on the presumption against three months sentences in itself is sort of compelling that, um, that there is reason, I think, to um, leave the judiciary uh, unshackled on, on that basis. Um, you know, and, and then we trust in the sense that they, they must be free to make decisions based on the individual they, they have before them. Um, and on that basis, I think, even with the presumption uh, against in place, uh, I have every expectation that we will still have people living with us in the future who are serving sentences of less than 12 months. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to just move on to the subject of the number of women um, being imprisoned. And Mr. Mavy gave the, the, the shocking statistic of 90% of, of women are, are serving sentences of 12 months or less. You know, seven in 10 of those women um, are victims of domestic abuse. 65% are mothers. Um, so, you know, those statistics are, are incredibly alarming. Um, so we know that one and a half million uh, pounds has been put into to women's, funding women's services. What my question is, is, I mean, in my view, you know, that there would, could never be enough money put into that to, to cover all needs. But my question is, is some of it down to sort of organisational... Um, um, sort of lack of joined up organisations such as housing, um, the, event, the benefit system, you know, the NHS, getting together to sort of have a, a programme in place, which wouldn't necessarily be resource intensive, but just to actually make it easier for women um, not to, to have to be in prison, or if they are in prison, when they come out, to have things put in place so they wouldn't re-offend and, and, you know, it would be the revolving door that we, we, we we're used to. Um, I just think it's a massive problem and, you know, and, and we shouldn't be doing it, basically. Can, can maybe ask Laura your view? Well, certainly the, the, the figures you quote are ones that we're all familiar with and they are indeed shocking. Um, I think the, there may be examples of, of good practice from places like Northern Ireland where they have um, what are called enhanced com combination orders, um, where they, as part of their overall problem-solving problem approach to justice, so they focus on rehabilitation, reparation, restorative justice and desistance. Mm -hmm. and these are more expensive than um, CPOs, but they're less expensive than, than maybe sending someone into, into prison, particularly as we know the outcomes are not so good. So I think they're um, echoing uh, Colin McConnell's earlier point about perhaps looking at the system in its entirety. There are other things that we could maybe think of doing and investing in. Can I ask you how long that system has been in place in Northern Ireland? Uh, since roughly? 2015, I think, in Northern Ireland. Right, yeah, okay, so it's relatively, it relatively new. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, Mr Maybe? Yeah. Yes, I, I'm sure that, um, members will recall the Commission on, <coughs> Commission on Women Offenders that was yeah. led by Dame Ailish yeah. Angelini, mm -hmm. um, which was a very influential um, mm -hmm. report and very f wide reaching in terms of what's required to, to work with, with women who've offended. Um, and certainly across the local authority landscape, that's very much become the template in terms of how we structure services for women. And it is very much about trying to create um, seamless services, one-stop shops, um, to draw in all the agencies' services that are available um, so that women aren't going from place to place. Um, sometimes that can be done physically by bringing people together in one space. Sometimes it's, it, that's not possible. Um, simply because of the infrastructure around, but it is about linking people in um, so that people aren't telling the same story twice. Um, and it is very much about bringing services together. Um, so I think that that's a journey. I, I wouldn't claim that we've reached the end point of that. Mm. Um, well, we, we still have the same number of women in prison as there was, mm. you know, 10 years ago. So that there's, there's something missing, isn't there? There's, there's, I mean, I hear what you're saying, and, uh, but there's, is there's something not working when there's still that amount of women being... Um, receiving custodial sentences. And I think community justice is obviously is still relatively in its infancy in terms of Community Justice Scotland and the, the arrangements for community justice. That is very much about bringing all the players in the justice system together mm -hmm. locally within local areas. Um, and I think that, again, we're part way through that journey in terms of people bringing their knowledge, their <coughs> skills, their experience, looking at what the gaps are in the, in the criminal justice system. Um, how do we resource and fill those gaps? Um, collectively, and it's not just about criminal justice social work or Police Scotland or Scottish Prison Service or third sector agencies, but what can we collectively do? Mm -hmm. I think that's it's a very challenging agenda. Yeah. Um, we're only a couple of years into that, and I think mm -hmm. we need to give that time to, to breathe and to develop um, and build that trust and confidence locally. Um, that applies to working with women and, of course, to men as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I think... You know, it, it's a good concept, it's a good model, um, but we need to, to go further in terms of actu actually really sharing resources in, in a true sense yeah. amongst partner agencies. Yeah. And presumably the presumption against uh, 12 months or less would help 
that figure. If you know, if if, if ninety percent um, of women are in for twelve months or less, once the presumption against that, you would imagine that uh, that wouldn't happen quite as much. Being optimistic about it. Being optimistic, mm -hmm. um, clearly, it's a matter for, for yeah. sentences. Yeah. Um, I mean, I would make the point that um, at the point of sentence, you know, a sheriff or indeed a judge has a significant amount of information um, before them. Uh, they can't make a community payback order unless they have a criminal justice associate report. Mm -hmm. um, that report contains a wealth of information regarding the, the offence and, and previous offending, assessing risk and need using. Um, accredited tools, um, both for g g general offending and specific tools, for example, for domestic abuse, the spousal assault risk assessment tool, um, for sex offenders. Um, all that information is, is laid out to the sentencer to help inform them. And I think it's particularly important in terms of, from a victim perspective, that report will contain information about who is at risk, um, what's the seriousness if, if that offending was to happen again, the likelihood of, of that impact. Uh, I think we need to go further. I think we need more information at the point of sentence. We need to, often we're just reliant on what the offender tells the social worker, and that's not frankly good enough. Um, we need to get objective information about what somebody has done. Some people, of course, are honest and, and will be upfront about what they've done and the impact, but, but some won't, and that, that's, that's just a fact of life. Um, so I would like to... to, to to see social workers getting that information, getting what we call summaries of evidence in all cases, to give us that holistic information about what somebody has done so we can really analyse offending, really analyse the potential risk to victims um, and put forward proposals to the court which are credible. Um, and it does happen that a sheriff will read a report and say, this is just not credible because the offender hasn't been honest about what they've done. Okay. And we need to fill that gap. <coughs> We have three panels today. We're working to a very tight schedule uh, time scale, and we've already overrun. We will have to include this session by 11. So could I ask the um, following questions from members and um, the responses from the panel to be as succinct as possible. Lee MacArthur, followed by Shona, then Jenny. Thanks very much. Uh, good morning. <coughs> we've touched on some of this, but I'd be interested to know the panel's assessment of what the impact of that presumption against three, sen <coughs> three months sentences has been. Uh, we heard from Rona Mackay about um, some concerns around uh, up tariffing. We've also seen a reduction uh, in the figures, but that predates the introduction of the presumption. And linking that to what the expectation would be of extending that presumption to 12 months, given what we, we know about the, uh, what has happened since 2011. In terms of the custodial uh, population, I think I think this information has already been uh, shared with with the panel. But uh, you know, so for example, this morning there's 1,049 uh, people in our care, um, seven sentences up up to 12 months. So if we use the justice analytics um, <coughs> formula uh, on the basis of um, the the decremental effect of that that presumption. Um, a, 50% uh, take up, if you like, by, by the sheriffs. Um, that, that could, uh, over time, uh, have 525 or so fewer people uh, in our care. But the, um, the figure that Justice Analytics uh, are settling on at the moment, which is based on the evidence around um, the uh, presumption against three months, is around 20%. So over time, and again, it's, it's, it's considering the difference between stock and churn. So whilst uh, over time it could see something in excess of a thousand fewer people passing through prison in any given year, it will actually only reduce the stock of people serving a sentence by about 200 on any, on any given day. Uh, so you know, potentially you know, we, we could still see a significant number of people uh, in our care serving sentences of, of less than 12 months. But if I may offer the view, I think that could well be appropriate if we're not going to shackle the judiciary and allow them to make decisions for, for what they believe is the right decision for that individual in front of them. And, and 
join others as well, but as uh, I think Kate Wallace, you earlier was suggesting concerns of some victims' groups about certain types of offences falling within that, <coughs> that broad presumption. Is that, a, is that a concern that's shared more widely across the, the panel within the sector? It could be as succinct as possible. That would be appreciated. Well, the position would be that we think this is a matter for the sentencer. We wouldn't be proposing or suggesting that it's restricted to certain offences. Sentencing matter. Right. Okay. Okay. Sure. Uh, just, just taking <coughs> that a little bit further, the the, the twenty percent um, assumption on reduction of custodial sentences that we can take from the three months. Um, I think it was yourself, Laura Hoskins, said earlier on that this huge variation in sentencing. You, I think you mentioned Alawa as being um, a, a court where um, they have less short sentences. And I guess um, my question would be, why is there such a variation? Because, and what is driving that? Obviously, we all support the, I think it was uh, yourself, Colin McConnell, that said, you know, unfettered but guided policy. But clearly, even within that, there's nothing particularly different about Aloha and the population it serves. So there's something driving different custodial decisions even within the same policy and I'd be interested just briefly to hear what what you think that is the independence of the judiciary the the, the fact the in the the evidence from Clats council where they actually mentioned the Alwa sheriff court they, they mentioned the the sheriff and, and and I think it picks up in an early point that I think Colin McConnell made or or maybe James actually around relationships mm -hmm. and it, obviously in a small area you know you're possibly potentially more likely to know the people that are coming up in front of you I don't know and um, that's probably a more appropriate question for for um, sheriffs but I think you know we have to recognise the, their independence in making those decisions. I mean, we all do, but I think in order for a policy to be successful, we need to understand why it's more successful in some areas than others. Um, it would be helpful, perhaps, also to get the figures for, for each uh, court, which I think we, sh we should do. Um, but those sound like quite soft issues. It's about maybe trust, relationships, trust in the alternatives. Is that your kind of educated guess of, of what would be going on there? Yeah, I think... Um you know, it's, uh, again, as before, it's a range of issues. I think it is about the independence of the uh, shrivel benches. I think it's about, in, in different locations, the availability of uh, alternatives mm -hmm. and the perception of how effective those alternatives are. It's about sheriffs having the information to hand both about the individual and about the alternatives. The sheriff's job then to, you would imagine, match that up in terms of what's the best disposal. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think it's a common picture across the landscape. I think it's it's quite diffused. Um, that's my, my mm -hmm. sort of informed uh, position uh, on it. But it's, it's not just about, I think, sheriffs acting independently, although they do. I, I think the, uh, the variations in provision and information that's available also influence that. And just finally, uh the su success, as we've heard, albeit some of those variations, the success of the, the three-month policy, uh, has that been of interest to uh, other parts of the UK, given the direction of travel? Um, I think maybe particularly Colin McConnell, whether you've had any uh, visitations from ministers or, or officials, either from other parts of the UK or indeed further afield, to look at the success of the three-month policy? Yes, yes, very much so. Um, I mean, there has been uh, in the past uh, interest uh, from uh, England and Wales in terms of Scotland's position, both the journey towards the presumption, because England and Wales appear to be taking a, a different approach, but certainly the journey towards the presumption, uh, as, as well as more broadly, um, how that relates to delivery of services, certainly in our, in our uh, world, in, in the custodial space. So I think we have been seen uh, as uh, a sort of leading the way uh, as, as far as considering what court disposals it might be, but in the context of the impact for the, for the individual, and that's what we should all be concerned about, getting the right impact for the individual. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. I would certainly echo that. Um, and I make reference in the Social at Scotland response to a report um, May 2019, what could England and Wales learn from Scotland's approach to justice? So 
I think other jurisdictions are very much looking at what's going on in Scotland, looking at the good practice, learning from that and evaluating it. And I think that's, that says something very positive about the criminal justice system in Scotland. Jenny, your area has been covered, so our final question comes from Liam Kerr. Uh, I'll, I'll be very brief, convener, and I, I'd like to speak to Kate Wallace, particularly if I may. Just three questions for you. Uh, first of all, uh, just I'm sticking on the CPO side of things, if I may. <coughs> first of all, you talked several times earlier on about victims and the public's confidence in the system. Now, I understand that one in three of the CPOs are currently not completed. Um, do you think <coughs> if there are more people coming into that system, that statistic is likely to get worse, and how will that play with victims in the public? I think it's the point about resourcing, isn't it, and about having effective um, interventions and effective community payback orders. Um, and like Social Work Scotland, um, we are concerned about ensuring that there's enough resources um, round about community payback orders um, to make sure they're as effective as possible. And also, transparency around it. I find this area very opaque. It's very difficult to get information out about breaches, about um, repeat um, community payback orders. Um, so, and there are things that go on um, for victims um, and support that's provided to them within um, the criminal justice system where a custodial sentence has been given that there isn't um, in the community payback orders um, where perhaps we could look at that. So information about whether or not somebody is engaging or not, information about whether or not somebody has breached an order, um, and information about whether or not they've successfully completed one, I think um, would help within that um, to address some of the public um, con safety concerns and some of the victims' concerns. I'm grateful. I think it's an excellent point. Um, VSS uh, Victim Support said in February uh, that custodial sentences provide victims of domestic abuse with some breathing space. And you make a similar point in the submission. Can you help the committee understand what safeguards are in place currently for victims of domestic abuse if the abuser gets a community disposal? And what I, I'm concerned about is, is there a danger that people just go back to the homes that they came from? I think the timing of the, the presumption against short sentences was designed to coincide with the new Domestic Abuse Act in Scotland around coercive control um, and around um, non-harassment orders and stuff like that to, 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 to provide some protection um, to address some of those issues. Um, so I think that in terms of timing, um, the new Domestic Abuse Act should um, potentially assist with that. Uh, and finally for me, uh, you say in your submission that the current presumption so the three months presumption that we looked at is inadequate uh, in terms of its protections for victims and witnesses. Do you take a view on, if, if the current presumption is inadequate, shouldn't this whole process be put on hold until we are absolutely certain that sufficient protections are in place? And that relates back to my earlier point about information for victims, about more transparency and around um, the more resources being put into community payback orders to ensure that they work effectively because without that um, we're potentially going to in a situation where Scotland is taking quite a bold step but as Colin and others have rightly pointed out if, there's, if, the, if the resources around community um, payback orders are not put in place then we could be monitoring this very very carefully as people will and look back in a year or two's time um, and, and, and see that the effect of this has not been what um, what we had expected. So, um, so yeah, for me, there's there's a number of things that could be put in place um, around increased transparency, information to victims, um, to support and help them understand what is actually going on around community payback orders, um, the level of compliance or not, that type of thing. As I said earlier on, I'm conscious of your time. Can I thank the panel for your evidence, and especially for the written evidence, which the committee finds particularly helpful. We'll now suspend for two minutes to allow for a change of witnesses.
I am pleased to welcome our second panel, Dr Katrina Morrison, Board Member, Higher League Scotland, Dr Sarah Armstrong, Scottish Centre for Crime and Justice, Research University of Glasgow, and Professor Cyrus Tata, Director of the Centre for Law, Crime and Justice, the University of Strathclyde. Could I perhaps ask, um, begin by asking the panel about the resource implications currently for short-term custodial sentences and the alternative community service um, orders, and in terms of how this will play to the extension of a presumption of 12 months. Who'd like to start? Yes, Dr thank Morrison. You. Thank you. Um, <coughs> the extension of the presumption can't be, um, can't be supported in order because it's going to save money. That's not something, that's not a reason um, for supporting this. We do support the um, extension of the presumption, but not as a cost-saving um, exercise. Um, it will require significant resources um, in order to make it work, um, as has been outlined um, by the earlier panel. Um, so in order for community alternatives to be regarded as credible and legitimate, um, uh, statutory and third sector organisations must be adequately um, funded. Um, it's not, I'd also just like to say, it's not just about funding for criminal justice um, services. We also need to be thinking about adequate and robust um, resourcing beyond the criminal justice system. So we need to be thinking about um, services for mental health, addiction, housing, employment and so forth. If these services aren't also adequately funded, then we're setting people up to fail. Um, and also then that runs the risk of people being sent to custody in order to access those services, yeah. which is also inappropriate. Um, so yes, the point was made earlier that um, in the long, long term, this could result in a, a saving of money, but, uh, but that will not be the case if it's going to work well, um, certainly initially. Okay, thank you. And Dr. Armstrong, we'll do it in order okay. that you're okay. sitting. Um, well, I agree very much with what Dr. Morrison said about it would be overly simplistic to try to look at it as the comparative cost of community sentences versus prison. There's a lot more cost to be thinking about it. And so I don't want to repeat anything she said, but maybe just point out that my speculation, and that's untested, is that there would be increased costs associated with that. I, although Colin McConnell suggested there would be 500 fewer people in prison, a number I'm not so sure about, but if that was the case, I've not heard him say he would close a prison of 500 beds. And um, without the closure of a prison of that size, you're still going to be incurring significant costs associated with prison. In terms of the community sentence side of it, there are costs associated with community sentences, which is not just to include the running of them, but managing the breach. And one of the points that I raised in my written submission of evidence to this committee was that community sentences are themselves a driver of prison population growth. And so that uh, needs to be modeled and analyzed by an economist, probably. Thank you. Professor Tata. Thank you. Um, you raise a, an excellent question chair about resources and I think that comes gets to the heart of the matter we talk about this proposal as something bold and radical actually if you look at the formulation of it in section 17 it's really a rehash of what we've been trying to do for the last 30 to 40 years which is to say that it doesn't use the, the language here in the in the legislation in the 2010 act but ministers have talked about this again, which is to say, basically, prison is a last resort. Don't pass a custodial sentence unless you think it's appropriate. Who passes a sentence that they think would be inappropriate? Who does anything in life which they think a serious decision which they think is inappropriate? So I think my first point is I, I'm less sure, actually, that this um, proposal is actually going to change a huge amount, in fact. We can easily end up with a polarised debate around, you know, and I understand absolutely the concerns of, 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 kind of victims groups and so on around that, and I see the point of that. But I think, given how permissive the legislation is, I'm not sure we'll see that much of a difference. In fact, the, the government's own research published in 2015 said, um, and I quote, that there was little sign of the presumption figuring prominently or explicitly in decision making and so on, and uh, really made the point that 
again, it's, it's not in itself going to make a difference. Now, the problem is the one you identify, which is that there's a group of people who are serving short custodial prison sentences by instalments, almost life sentences by instalments. And um, actually, everybody pretty much agrees that many of these people are non-dangerous, shouldn't really be going to prison at all, and don't pose a threat other than often to themselves. Yeah. They end up going to prison, and I... It's wrong to blame the sentences. It's too easy to blame sentences or individual professional social workers' sentences and so on. They end up going to prison because it appears that no one else wants them. Their lives seem to be so chaotic. They're homeless, addiction problems, physical health, mental health. These problems are so chronic that often a sheriff will say, what else can I do? Nobody else wants them. And I don't think it's fair in general terms to blame the sheriffs. They're actually left with an apparent discretion, which is a kind of hollow virility symbol, because they're not equipped to do what they, sh what they would like to do, which is actually to make sure they know, most of them, I think, very well, that prison is not the right place for people whose, whose needs are actually often greater than their offending, far greater, that they've committed minor offences, but they don't show up for appointments and all the rest of it. So the sheriff says, eventually, what else can I do? Now, that's the group, I think, we can get a consensus around and we should be targeting and we should be thinking about that. So unless there is a, a plan to ensure there is a major change of resourcing around just what you say, not just community justice, but also community services more generally. Because often community services will say, we, don't, we can't deal with this person, it's too difficult. We end up using prison. And what are we doing? We're using the resource of prison essentially in the same way that the Victorians did. We use it as a poorhouse. We use it as the last line in the welfare state. That's a societal issue. It's not fair to point the finger at individual professionals, and it needn't be a party political issue. So my proposal is that, that we, and I've set it out briefly, that we have a principle stating who should not or what cases should not normally be imprisoned and that we have a, a date by which we ensure there's a transfer of resources. Because unless you have that transfer, I don't think this presumption proposal, whether it's 12 months or whatever, isn't going to make much difference. Because quite rightly, actually, the sheriffs by and large are going to say, well, I still think it's appropriate because there's nothing else. It's the last resort. Prison becomes the default. When nothing else seems to be there, prison never has to prove itself. Everything else has to prove itself. So I, I would like this committee to consider Obviously, we've got an issue here. It may well go through. That, in a sense, I think the much bigger issue for us is to have some vision. And if we want to be Scotland to be, as the successive justice secretaries have said, one of the most progressive in Europe, then we need a vision to say that by 2040 or such a year, give ourselves a target, we are going to stop using prison as a place essentially to access services. And I heard what Conor McConnell said, and he's doing the right thing as the director, as the chief exec of SPS. But we need to think as a society, is that what we should be doing? Should we really be locking people up because of their, essentially because of their needs and poverty related needs? And it's not even, it doesn't even make financial sense. Yeah. Sorry. That, 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 that's, that's pretty comprehensive and members will be going into that in, in some detail. Jenny. And um, Professor Tass has kind of touched upon uh, my line of questioning. Um, I looked, uh, Dr Morrison, at your written submission and you point to Scotland having uh, one of the highest prison rates in Western Europe. Um, and six months ago, nine out of Scotland's 15 prisons were at or above capacity. In April 2019, HMP Barlini was operating at 142% capacity. And obviously in the previous panel, um, we heard um, from Colin McConnell about uh, the current numbers uh, in our prison population. Why does the panel think that we still have such an attachment to imprisonment more generally? generally in Scotland in 2019? <laughs> well, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think, yeah, it has deep cultural and structural roots. Um, it's, it's, very, it, it's very easy to say, OK, we need to change um, the sentencing uh, legislation around this in order to reduce the pr prison population, but there's a cultural context mm -hmm. in which all of this is kind of sustained and legitimised that also needs to be addressed. Um, so we can kind of think about 
top-down approaches and policy changes and whatnot, but we really need to be having a deeper conversation about what punishment is and what it isn't in order for a real reduction in the use of imprisonment to be sustained. Um, you've probably read the recent um, Scottish Crime and Justice um, uh, survey um, which showed uh, that three quarters of the Scottish population say they know nothing or nearly nothing about um, the criminal justice system and actually in that sort of context um, it's very easy to have sort of populist reactions against you know offenders walking free from court if they're subject to a community yeah. sentence instead of a, a sentence of imprisonment and so forth so we need to be having a much deeper conversation I think involving everybody and civil society about what punishment is and isn't but there is also a bigger and again echoing um, what, um, what has been said before, that the solutions to this problem lie beyond the criminal justice system. These are really big structural problems relating essentially to questions of social inequality and social justice. And really, if you look across the world at countries that have got higher like, rates of um, imprisonment, there is a very strong relationship there with questions of um, social inequality. So we need to be looking beyond the criminal justice system as well. Just again, I think Dr. Morrison has summed up the situation quite well. That's the profound question that we'd all like to have an answer to. Mm -hmm. um, Scotland's imprisonment rate means that comparatively, if it were a state in the United States, it'd be Texas or Louisiana which makes no sense because unlike Texas or Louisiana, the social welfare policies and commitment in Scotland is quite the opposite. So this is the paradox that people like me, scholars of punishment in, Scot in, in Scotland are struggling with, is how mm -hmm. a country that's so committed to social welfare investment yeah. is also making such huge use of an incredibly expensive resources prison. My, my own sense is that there's a combination partly of a conservatism with a lowercase c, a sense of moving change at a particular pace in combination, ironically, with a very progressive spirit of wanting to do something to improve the situation. And I think sometimes we, we believe within the criminal justice sector and, sector and within criminology that we can solve the problems if we just do something differently. If we add a new reform, we add a new sentence, we come up with a new idea, we create a new agency, we create a new workforce, that we can solve this problem, that more people working on this problem will mean better results. We've seen the result of that has been only expansion of the criminal justice system. Following reform of bail and remand, the remand population increased. Following successive reform reviews of the number of women in prison, the number of women in prison has increased or, or remained stable, certainly not gone decreased by the, the three times what Dame uh, Angelini was looking for. So every time we try to come up with solutions within the criminal justice sector, we also come up with ourselves as the answer. There's a criminal justice solution to a social welfare problem. I'm a criminologist, and I am not qualified to offer advice about cancer care or the curriculum for excellence, but increasingly we're asking the criminal justice system to come up with solutions for people whose problems lie in substance abuse, in housing, in jobs, mm -hmm. in other kinds of um, settings than we are qualified to act on. <coughs> yeah, I, th I think the question about why is prison so, so central in our kind of cultural imagination is a really good one. Um, I think the point about welfare is, a, is an excellent one, um, that in a sense we so easily use prison as actually kind of penal welfareism. Um, that the idea that because nothing else out there seems to be good enough or seems to work for people, prison's the last line of the welfare state. That's what we're doing. We're using it as the poorhouse for, for many people. I have no problem with people who have committed serious offences who need to be there. They need to be there. That's, that's enough. But people who, whose offending is not serious and we wouldn't normally want to send to custody end up in prison because it seems like a place of sanctuary. It seems like a, a kind of... A, a, place that will help people. It's the old idea of using an institution to help. It's a Victorian idea. We'll use the institution to help people. Again, I don't blame individual practitioners for the dilemma they face, but as a society, we need to have much greater clarity of vision about what we're trying to do. We need to say that in X years' time, set ourselves a target date, we will not use prison as a place of welfare. Nobody should go to prison unless their offending demands it. Then when they're in prison, 
SPS can do the great rehabilitative work that they should and they want to do with people, but that churn shouldn't be happening. People shouldn't be sent to prison, essentially. And I don't blame, as I say, I don't blame practitioners, sheriffs and so on for that. But that we're using that really as, a, as the last line of the welfare state. We need to face up to that problem. And it is actually the desire to be benevolent, ironically, that you end up using prison more. Unless you've got clear, a clear vision and clear demarcation around what you're trying to achieve. Thank Jenny. you. Um, going back to the initial presumption, the number of individuals uh, receiving a custodial sentence for three months or less has decreased from, I think, 35% in 2010-11 to 27% in 2017-18. So do you think there is a role for sentencing in this context? I appreciate we've spoken about um, the wider welfare concerns as well, which ultimately play a huge role in, in terms of some of our, our prisoners in Scotland. But sentencing itself is part of a bigger picture, would you say, or is there a role for the presumption and can that help, do you think, in reducing the overall population? Probably um, the exception on this panel and that my thinking has really evolved on this and I no longer support a presumption against the short sentence. Um, and one of the reasons that I'm skeptical of it having an effect is this quite unilateral blunt tool of a single sentence change. Um, under the three-month presumption, initially bumped up the numbers of four-month and longer sentences. So it did seem to have an initial up-tariffing effect, which is not yet fully stabilized. We couldn't tell you today exactly how many people are in prison serving four months or three months or nine months because the prison service has not published prison statistics that have been validated since 2013-14. Um, another reason, though, that I wouldn't I don't think that the single sentencing change is enough is I think that there'll be unanticipated effects in other parts of the system. And so that this is a very elaborate architecture of sentencing and punishment that we've set up in this country. And making this one change is going to have some unanticipated effects, which I think will drive further net widening of the higher tariff population. There's no indication that the way the law would currently be phrased, which is simply not to use the sentence unless a judge feels it's absolutely necessary, will affect anybody who this legislation presumably is trying to target, which are the people doing the churn, who have serially served 10, 15, 20 of these sentences, those are precisely the people who a sheriff may feel, feels there's nothing else that can be done but to issue custodial sentence. You go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, yes, I'd echo uh, the comments that Dr. Armstrong's made in that creating or extending this presumption in and of itself is not going to create the policy objective of reducing reoffending. Um, Howard Lee Scotland do support the extension and believe it's a good first step, but it needs to happen alongside other measures. So recent um, uh, data published by the Council of Europe, which I think has been cited in one of your uh, written submissions, uh, show that Scotland has the highest number of people subject to penal sanctions, so that's imprisonment and community services together, than any other country in Europe. So it's not simply we can't think of transplanting people from the prison and putting them into community sentences as, as an achievement. Community sentences are still a sanction. They still impose harm. They're, they still are experienced negatively. Um, and actually, as Sarah said, community justice sanctions often have the effect of funneling people back into prison following breach or non-compliance. Um, so we need to really be thinking more ambitiously about reducing the penal state or the, the penal system um, and making greater use of diversion from custody, suspended sentences, um, deferred sentences, as well as thinking about um, questions of sentence length, etc. Yeah, um, to answer the, the, the question, um, I mean, the, the use of three months was already going down, and this is the government mm -hmm. has clearly noted that well before the presumption was actually implemented. I'm skeptical as to whether it's going to make much difference. The three-month presumption doesn't appear to have made much difference. I know the government has said that it's, and I noticed in one of its news releases that it sort of credited the presumption with a reduction in reconviction rates. I, I think that's a rather dodgy um, claim for all sorts of reasons, not least that the term conviction is about criminal conviction. There's been an enormous growth in direct measures, i.e. out of court offers of settlement like the 
fiscal fines and so forth. So, I mean, that, I, I, I would, I, I would uh, suggest that the committee look at that quite carefully. Um, so, I, I suppose for my part, I've never really been persuaded that the, this idea of a presumption, and this was at the time when the original legislation went through, coming up for 10 years ago now, I was always skeptical then, I'm afraid. I, I'm not sure it's going to make that much of a difference. So, in a sense, we got quite excited about it. And I know victims' groups are concerned and so on. In a sense, they don't need to be, I don't think, that concerned because the legislation is already very permissive. Um, and, it, and it says, well, don't do it unless you think it's appropriate. Well, that's what sheriffs surely have always been doing, and quite rightly so. Why would you want them to do anything that wasn't inappropriate? But my point is about, back to the resourcing issue, which is yeah, if, unless you, 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 you make sure that community services particularly are there, then understandably courts and other social work and so on actually say, well, do you know what? We can't do anything with it. It's got to be prison because that's the default. That's the last resort. If nothing else is there, it's prison. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Shona followed by Liam, uh, Liam Kerr. Yeah, Liam Kerr. I don't know if uh, the panel heard the previous evidence session, but one of the points made um, by Laura Hoskins from Community Justice Scotland was that part of the, the variation in the application of the existing three months sentencing um, was, she thought, and I think the panel probably agreed with her, um, down to what the, the trust and confidence the sheriff had in what the alternatives are within the locality. So I guess my question would be um, that, that actually the presumption against short sentences could be effective and appears to be in some areas particularly if it goes hand in hand with a confidence in the system and a variety of disposals. Is that something you would agree with? Well, the case. Um, but however, one, one thing I would say is we've got shockingly poor data in this country available and that's no criticism of the statisticians in government who do their best. We have very little data to be able to verify whether that's the case or not very little data about remand, very little data to really drill down. The quality of it is actually very poor. And comparing one locality with another is very difficult because you're often comparing apples with pears. You can say one area's got a high custody rate, one area's got a low custody rate, but unless you actually compare the seriousness of the caseloads mm -hmm. in each area, then it's meaningless. I know the government used to produce these kind of league tables, utterly spurious, I'm afraid, to come say that area X is harsher than another, unless you know what they what the caseload looks right. And you have to have proper data. Unless you've got that data, we just don't know. We, we just don't know on that point. But my, my hunch is that it's, yes, it's, yes I, I think you're right. The relationships are absolutely crucial and the sense of credibility is important. <clears throat> but I think I come back to the point, and I know I'm hammering it, but I really want the committee to consider in the long term, have this long term vision to say in the, we, we should have a target. And by this date, 2040 or whatever it might be, we are committing ourselves as a society to say, unless you're, the seriousness of your offending warrants it, we are not going to use the valuable resource of imprisonment, which is so damaging, unless, unless the offending requires it. And yes, Dr. Yeah, Martin. just just very quickly, um, it was highlighted in one of your written submissions. I think it was um, from Criminal Justice Voluntary uh, Forum. I may have. Um, I can't remember their exact name, but they said they were often frustrated when they spoke to sheriffs who didn't know the available services in their area. Mm -hmm. So I think there is more that can be done which might potentially help <coughs> by raising awareness of exactly all of the um, non-custodial services that, that are available. That might help. Good point. And um, uh, do, have you completed your line of questions? Yes, that's Shana? fine. Thank Liam you. Kerr. Very brief first question to Professor Tarte, if I may. Uh, is your view, just to reflect back something you just said, is your view that the current community system isn't there presently to, such that there would be any change to, uh, such that judges don't have confidence in moving out into it? Inevitably, judges are, and, and by the way, when we're thinking about sentencing, I should just preface by saying, don't forget about remand and backdating for remand, and our data on that is really poor. As far as I can see, there's, there's no, uh, um, you know, differentiation and say, you know, so actually a lot of the time someone will be remanded in custody because a sheriff will say, well, and, and a social worker will say, well, we can't 
you know, we, we need this, this person's in such a bad way, we end up sending them to, giving them remand. And then they might get a backdated custodial sentence, and we really need to look at that data. Um, but I think the problem is, yes, is, is one of resources. Inevitably, when you're faced with someone who's in that kind of situation, you are comparing. You're trying to look for, you, because you know this person hasn't committed a really serious, they're not a danger particularly to the public. You'd rather that they got help in the community, <coughs> etc. But actually, very often, and we've got to be honest about this, quite often people are saying, well, we don't really want this person. They don't say so quite as explicitly that, as that, but it's the message that comes across. The only place that will take them is prison. And so, therefore, prison almost becomes the attractive place. It becomes the ever-reliable option, while community penalties seem to be a little non-credible, slow, and particularly in the voluntary sector, their funding is often so precarious, mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's made unreliable by the precariousness of their funding. So sentences will often say, to pick up the point that Dr. Morrison said, well, is that service still available? They're not sure, but they know prison's always there. We all know prison's there as a society. These other things are almost made precarious, and we need to think about that problem. If I may move on, uh, Dr. Armstrong, uh, you say in your submission that there are flaws in the evidence that those given CPOs have lower reoffending rates than those given short sentences. Can you explain that to the committee, please? And if you're right on that, doesn't that undermine the central tenet of this legislation? I didn't say there are flaws. I said that the comparisons that are normally made aren't matched to compare similar populations. So what happens now is the statistics are, raw statistics are compared between those who have done a community sentence versus those who have done a short sentence to look at the reoffending patterns of those, reconvictions of those people two, over two years. That doesn't control for um, the histories of those people. And we know that people serving community sentences generally have um, M many fewer convictions because one of the systemic problems in Scotland is once you've been allowed to serve one or two community sentences, you are increasingly seen as a poor risk or someone unable to benefit from them and never given that opportunity ever again. And you're only then continuously given short sentences. So the short sentence prison population will be people who have done many short prison sentences or have had experience of community sentence. So, it's, so it is comparing apples and oranges. If you could match those populations, then you would know what the reconviction rates are. I, I'm afraid to say we just don't know. It may well be that community sentences for the similar population would have much better outcomes, but you couldn't do that just with a raw comparison of those two figures. What I will say is that in the research that I myself have done with Beth Weaver at Strathclyde University and that my colleague Margaret Schinkel has done, is that many people are ready to do a community sentence at when, after they've been quite deep into the system and had many convictions, and that when they do a community sentence, particularly when it's a project that feels meaningful, that that has had a huge impact on their lives and in, in transforming their sense of relationship to a given community. And I think there already has been some debate about this process by which people are excluded from receiving community sentences once they've served a prison sentence. That, to me, is a significant issue. I'm sorry, what, I forget what your other question was. Uh, no, that was a very comprehensive answer. I'm very grateful to you. Uh, just uh, now, I'm riffing slightly. Um, you talked about the meaningful activity out in the community. I will <laughs> be quick. It. I'm always quick, convener. Um, you talked about meaningful activity out in the community. Am I, am I right from your research that one in four community sentences don't have any of that purposeful activity or it's unpaid, it doesn't have any unpaid work element. Is that right? That wasn't my research, but that might well be shown in the community um, social work, criminal justice social work statistics. Um, I think, you know, there, there could be an issue and actually probably Dr. Morrison would be in a better position to speak to that than I am possibly. <laughs> um, I, I would only add, I, I, I don't know about the details of, um, of CPOs for different sentence lengths, I'm afraid I'm happy to um, send that to you later if you want, um, but I would say that uh, that doesn't mean that prison is the solution because as Connell, um, Colin McConnell himself said earlier on, we know that that activity also isn't being provided in a prison setting. Um, so. 
Maybe I could just go back, though, to uh, Ms. Robinson's point about why different different areas use community sentences at different rates as an alternative, and is there a trust or confidence issue? First, I would say is I think alternative is the wrong terminology to be using, as community sentences at the moment are not alternatives, and with this presumption would not be alternatives. They are working and have worked under the three-month presumption as additions to sentencing. So we've seen growth both in the community payback orders and in the prison population. So there is no al alternative, there's no kind of balance between those things as we're increasing both those populations, which is why, as uh, Dr. Morrison pointed out, that Scotland has the largest proportion of people under some form of criminal justice control than anywhere else, except, I believe, I think Russia and Turkey <coughs> are ahead. Uh, so, so there's that issue there. I just, I just wanted to clarify that. I think that's very helpful. Um, Fulton Supplementary, and then Rona and David, and again, I'll remind, remind uh, members that we're against the clock. Yeah. <clears throat> Thanks, Convener. Um, and bearing that in mind, it's, it's just a very quick supplementary. I think that um, I agree fully with the panel, and thanks to the panel for your very articulate uh, views. And I agree with where we where we need to get to. I mean, I'm in no doubt at all. I think most people will be here that the population that we're talking about today, that this legislation targets, shouldn't be in custody, uh, in my own view. Um, but like uh, Dr. Uh, Morrison, I see this as, a, as part of a package to, to get us to that place. Um, um, Professor Tata, you've, uh, you've um, put forward um, a very powerful uh, stance today. I just wanted to ask, is there anything that y y you, know, you think the committee and the parliament could do, could legislate for, to get to the point that you've spoken about? Well, thanks for the invitation to <laughs> discuss that. Um, Yes, um, whether it be the parliament, whether it be a body, uh, some kind of, we need some kind of an of sort of principle, uh, author authoritative principle, which says, by this point in time, we will cease to use, as a society, imprisonment for people's, simply for, <laughs> unless people's offending warrants it. And at the end of my submission, I set out a kind of two-part principle, both parts together. Obviously, principles don't produce results in themselves, but it gives us a vision. It's a bit like, you know, sort of saying having a climate change target or whatever. It is. This is our target date, and this is this is how we might concentrate minds. I think unless we have that, we're going to continue in this discussion that we've been having for the last 40 years. The extension of the presumption is, um, I know it sounds bold on its face. To my mind, it's simply a rehash of the same thinking, which uh, you, you can call last resort thinking. Don't do this, don't pass a, a sentence of imprisonment unless it's the last resort. Well, unless you make sure <laughs> that you know, what's in the community is, is really reliable, then inevitably people who nobody really wants to see ending up in prison and who cost us as a taxpayer, apart from anything else, even if you don't take the moral case financially, it's, it's perverse. Um, Unless we do that, we're going to carry on with that churn, I think. I'm not sure that the presumption is... Um, I'd like to be proved wrong. I'm not sure the presumption will make a huge difference. And I kind of share and I understand the concerns of victims' groups about that in that 12-month kind of cohort, you, you can end up with some quite nasty offences, which we might say, actually, they, they, they are deserving of imprisonment. Having said that, I think we can trust the judiciary that they, on that point. But my point is, actually, that we that we need to think as a society about what prison is not for. Not what it's for, but what it's not for. It's not a sanctuary. It's not a school. It's not a hospital. Now, OK, we might be using that, it like that at the moment, and Colin McConnell talked about how he had to do that, give people a warm, dry bed, give people a place of safety. And, uh, you know, I understand that he's doing his best and they're doing their best. But we need as a society to have a target date by which we say, we're just going to stop doing that. That's not what we're about in Scotland anymore. And I don't disagree with anything you've said and, and the principle of what you've said. I suppose the only other um, quick question that, that, that I would have for you around that is if we were to put in place some principle, whether that's through legislation or another body, as you say, does that not uh, run in some sort of conflict with another key premise of the criminal justice system in Scotland that it would take away the discretion, or to some extent the discretion of sentencers, but which obviously we want to protect as well? I mean, I'm, I'm all in favour of judges being able to use their sensible discretion. I think the problem at the moment isn't so much that they are being, they're, they're being stopped 
uh, from using imprisonment, that this, this extension will continue to allow them to use that, but rather the opposite, that, they, that the, the discretion they have, they often find frustrating because it's, it's hollow, it's a hollow virility symbol, that often they feel that they can't, they're simply not equipped to do what they feel they should be doing. We don't want this person to go to custody, we don't want to remand them in custody, we know that's damaging. You know, I think the, the Shrieval bench in general is probably very different from what it was 30 years ago. They're, they're much more enlightened, I think. Um, they, we don't want to do this, but we don't see any other option. At least they don't see it there. And there, there, are, there are lots of aspects to that. But one of them is about us making sure as a society that we really make a major kind of shift of resources so that community services, as well as community justice, but community services are there for people. Otherwise, they just say, well... I have to use imprisonment because there's nowhere else. It's the last result, i.e. it's the default. And this legislation and this presumption is still in the last resort, i.e. imprisonment as the default discourse. That's the problem with it. It's still the same old idea. Rona then, Daniel. Thank you. Um, yes, I'd like to return to my earlier point about women in prison. I'm not going to, you probably heard it, so I'm not going to rerun everything that I said. But given what Professor Tata was saying about um, only the most serious um, offences should be uh, custodial and targets. Should we be setting a target that um, no woman should serve a, a less than 12 months uh, sentence, say by 2030? I mean, is it, would that be pr progress? Um, I see where you're coming from, and that's a really nice question. Personally, I would still always go for, couch it in terms of the seriousness of the case. Now that has many aspects and there's detailed work that could be done and indeed as the Scottish Sentencing Council really kind of develops its and, and establishes itself further as it's doing, it may well decide it has the confidence to start looking at what that would look like, i.e. what the seriousness means and that's perfectly possible to do. But that's a long-term project. While I absolutely agree that women in particular, there are particular issues. Many of those issues are also true for men. They, they can, the proportion can be a bit different, but they are, you know, a lot of the things that we talk about. Sure. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily, myself, I'm not sure that would be the most, I would prefer to just couch it in terms of the seriousness of the offence. Now, gender may well be a part of that, of course. When you do the detailed work, then you can start saying, well, there are certain aspects of imprisonment that may affect women in certain ways that don't affect men and so forth, or in different ways. <coughs> okay, thank you. Just briefly, anyone else have a view? Um, yes, we absolutely we recognise the very, very vulnerable um, and highly victimised um, experiences that women in custody have and uh, the fact that a greater number of them are serving very short sentences than in the male population. Um, so we support any measure that uh, will reduce the numbers of those women in custody. Um, again, um, you know, just highlight, but we would probably not support um, a target of no women uh, for the reasons uh, in, in custody, for the reasons that Syra has outlined. But if we're looking at seriousness of offence and particularly related to, you know, violence, etc., um, then uh, if we followed that principle, then many women would not um, yeah. be in custody. Okay. Yeah. Daniel. Thank you, convener. I mean, the tenor of your evidence seems to be that. We've identified the right problem, but we're not really looking at the underlying causes of what's here. And indeed, I remember struck by Dr. Armstrong's written submission, which she, where you, you pose the, the, the rhetorical question, uh, is it the sentence or something more fundamental that doesn't work for uh, short-term prisoners? So on that, that basis, can I ask the panel two questions? Um, first of all, is there actually any evidence base for picking a, 12 months as the, the threshold? Um, and then, if not, and, and, and thinking about your answers more widely that you've given this morning so far, should we be looking actually at, at having more precision in our sentencing? And indeed, uh, Laura Hawkins raised the enhanced combination orders that are used in Northern Ireland, which actually have explicit components to address uh, such things as sort of social uh, you know, uh, you know, rehabilitation and so on and so forth. Is that really what we should be looking at? So those are two questions. Is 12 months arbitrary? And, and uh, should we be having kind of a, a different type of approach to, to, to sentencing? And, and that's 
all I'll be asking the panel. I realise there's a lot in that, that, that question. If you could be as succinct as possible, it would be very much appreciated. If you'd like to start, Dr. Just Armstrong. briefly, yes and yes, 12 months is arbitrary. I have not seen any evidence for three months, six months, nine months, 12 months at all. There's, there's no research that can tell you what the magic number is. That is you know, possibly decision for you rather than for us. Um, are there alternative sentences that we should be thinking about? The combination order that you mention sounds a lot like moving a heavily circumscribed experience within a prison to a heavily circumscribed experience in the community. What European countries make use of that Scotland does not are suspended sentences, uh, or at least to any significant degree, where somebody may be given a prison sentence with, with some conditions attached to it, primarily not committing that offense again or not committing any offense again, but also possibly engaging in other services, but also receiving some supportive services. So I don't want to say that you know, with certainty that's what should be done, but there are alternatives to thinking about this. What my, my, my submission was mainly targeting the fact that the, the legislation is changing a sentence. It's not changing the situation or addressing a group of people who experience that sentence. And thank you. Um, Dr. Morrison. Yeah. Sorry, thank you. Uh, yes, 12 months is an arbitrary figure, but any <laughs> figure, in a sense, is arbitrary. Um, we highlighted in our written submission that Finland um, envisages that all sentences of two years and less are, um, are um, translated into community um, um, supervision. So that, again, is an arbitrary figure, but one that um, supports their significantly reduced use of imprisonment. Um, so arbitrariness in and of itself needn't be a problem, I would argue. Um, in terms of different sentencing approaches, we can definitely look to uh, suspended sentences, deferred sentences, also much greater use of diversion from custody. Uh, we might also consider, for example, approaches used in problem-solving courts. So there was a recent evaluation of the problem-solving um, court in Aberdeen, which showed how effective that could be as well. So there are kind of targeted um, changes as well that I think could support these proposals. And finally, briefly, Professor Tatha. Briefly, um, yes, 12 months is arbitrary in criminological terms. It's something that they've gone for 12 months because it's, it's top-end summary powers, although it isn't quite because there are exceptions around that, but that's for another discussion. Um, I would personally prefer not using the category of time to try to identify you know, who should be presumed not to get a prison sentence and who should, as I've said, it's, I think it's much more justifiable to use the broad language of the, the seriousness of the case uh, and then there can be work done around that. I think time is a problem, which is why you've kind of got, if you like, the, the concerns from victims groups and so on and I think it's more difficult to justify. But anyway, that, that's what may well go through here. But I suppose my appeal to the committee is if you, if you would consider, you know, kind of also raising the gaze to thinking about what we should be doing long term because I don't know if this is going to have that much effect. Okay. Can I thank all the witnesses for their evidence today? If there's anything that's occurred to you in the course of giving that evidence and you want to write to the committee, please do so. But thank you so much for your written submissions for appearing today. We would normally have a comfort break at this time. We're only going to suspend for two minutes because one of our witnesses has to go categorically for 12.15. So can I thank the, the panel and ask the, the next panel to take their seats?
I'm pleased to welcome our third and final panel for today, the Right Honourable Lord Turnbull, Senator of the College of Justice, and Graham Ackerman, Secretary of the Scottish Sentencing Council. I refer members to Paper 1, Public Paper, and Paper 2, a private paper. And we'll now start with questions, starting with Daniel Johnson. Just begin by thanking the, the, the panel for coming. In particular, I think it's always useful for legislators to engage in dialogue with sentences. I think that's really fundamental, the job that we do. Can I ask Lord Turnbull um, then, we, we've heard from the previous panels that, that the alternatives to prison sentences exist, but um, that, that, that for a variety of speculated reasons that sentences uh, don't use them. I was just wondering if Lord Turnbull could give his, his view as to why sentences perhaps prefer or, or, uh, prison sentences to, to the alternatives that exist at the moment, and, 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 and therefore the, 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 this, the, this proposal coming forward. We'd like to, to start. Uh, Lord Turnbull? Uh, not entirely sure I would understand the premise which you've used that uh, sentencers would prefer prison sentences. I, I did hear the tail end of uh, some of your previous witnesses, and uh, I heard Professor Tata explain that, uh, in his opinion, uh, the Shrevo bench uh, is occupied by sentencers who would prefer not to send people to prison uh, if they could. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, a view that, uh, that I, I would recognise. So th the question then, I suppose, from your perspective is, uh, why are so few non-custodial sentences being imposed, as one, one might categorise them. I'm sure that the answer to that uh, is in, in two parts. The, the first is that sentencers uh, are guided by uh, a number of considerations, uh, but one of which is plainly the seriousness of the offence. Uh, and the principles and purposes of uh, sentencing guideline, which the Council produced uh, fairly recently, <clears throat> identified as one of the principles, the principle of parsimony, uh, namely that a sentence should be no more severe uh, than uh, is necessary to achieve the sentencing aim which the sentencer has in mind. So one would assume from that uh, which, by the way, we consider to be a principle which reflected long-standing sentencing practice. So we would, we would assume from that that if a sentencer was to select a period of imprisonment as a sentence, and for example, say in the range of six to nine months, that he or she must have concluded that because of the gravity of that particular offence, or because of the circumstances of the offender, or a combination of the two, that there was no other uh, appropriate sentence uh, available. Now that then, I suppose, leads into the question of, well, what are the alternatives? Uh, the alternatives which are, are currently available uh, are, are well liked, I, I'm confident. Uh, they uh, are alternatives which are recognised as being robust, they're, they're not in any sense a soft option. Uh, a community payback order, for example, with a supervision requirement and with a requirement to perform unpaid work in the community has both a punitive element to it and a rehabilitative element to it. However, if there were other options available to sentencers, uh, then those sentencers who feel that the available options to them uh, mean that they've no choice but to select a custodial sentence might be able to come to a different conclusion. And I know, for example, over recent years, that projects such as the uh, Caledonian Men's Project and the, the Tay Project uh, have increased uh, in, in popularity uh, and they have been used more and more by sentencers. And they've con they, they are considered to be uh, effective and they are disposals that sentencers have confidence in. As time has gone on, projects of that sort have become available more broadly than they once were. Uh, I don't believe that they are still universally available, 
Uh, but uh, I understand that the Caledonian Men's Project, for example, uh, is being rolled out to most parts of the country. Uh, and th there's also an interesting project in the Sheriff Court at Hamilton, where uh, the court is looking at using what it's calling uh, a structured deferred sentence approach. At the moment, principally, if not exclusively, in relation to, to young offenders, uh, but it's a project which permits the sentencer to engage in a managerial fashion uh, with the offender, similar perhaps to the sort of concept of a problem-solving court. Uh, and the pilot project seems to be uh, proceeding well, uh, and the perception is uh, that it's effective uh, and appears to receive uh, far fewer breaches, for example, uh, than community payback orders do. So once that pilot project is completed, it, it may be that something of that sort will be available more broadly as well. And all of these options, uh, if available, uh, will uh, provide a sentencer who at the moment concludes that perhaps a sentence of six or nine months imprisonment is the only suitable uh, sentence available to him to, to come to a different view. Thank you. In the interest of time, I'll end yes. up with. Um, do you have anything to, to add? I know Lord Turnbull and I are both here representing the Sentencing Council. Okay, so that's, that's absolutely fine. And um, Shona, then Liam Kerr. Uh, Lord Turnbull, you've just touched on this. We explored in the, the, the previous panels about the geographic variation in, in relation to the success of the um, presumption against sentences of three months or less. And what was suggested by um, Laura Hoskins from Community Justice Scotland was very much the point that you're making that, that sometimes it depends on what is available, but also perhaps the softer end of that, the, the confidence that the sheriff has in those alternative disposals. Is that something in your experience you would agree with? I'm perhaps not best placed to, to offer uh, a very informed view on that. I, I suspect that uh, sentencers from the Sheriff Court might be better mm -hmm. placed to inform you on that. But my overall sense is that modern sentencers uh, do not consider non-custodial sentences to be soft options. There is a range now. There, there are, for example, drug treatment and testing orders, which are very onerous. Uh, and I think people's experience of, of those orders uh, is that they, they have to accept uh, an inbuilt uh, period of partial failure. People who, are, who, who undertake those programmes cannot just simply transform their lives instantly. Uh, and so it, it's recognised that there will be a period during which compliance will be less than perfect. But the sentencers tend to, to invest in that disposal uh, and to stick with it. Uh, but there are other disposals which are, are very far from soft options <coughs> as well. The, the requirement to perform unpaid work uh, in the community is a significant uh, form uh, of undertaking. Uh, it, it not only requires uh, effort on the part of the individual, but of course it has a constructive element to it as well. And I think I heard one of your other contributors say that uh, evidence tends to demonstrate that it, it, it can transform their lives in, in a positive way as well. So I would be surprised if there was a general sense that uh, community-based disposals were something of an unviable soft option. It was suggested by one of the uh, pieces of evidence that perhaps awareness wasn't always as good as it could be about the range of disposals yes. available. Do you think that's something that could be tackled? Well, that, that might be right. Uh, again, what's important, uh, I imagine, is that uh, if new opportunities become available, that the judiciary is fully aware of what they are. Uh, and uh, of the scope for benefit that they present. So there's a role there for social work department, uh, for other uh, <coughs> third sector organisations perhaps, uh, and also for uh, the Judicial Institute, which provides national judicial training. But uh, it's, it's important that judges are kept aware of what's available. So, for example, in ruling out the, the, the Caledonian Men's Project or something like the Tay Project, it would be very important to educate the judiciary in the receiving jurisdictions as to what these particular projects can provide. Thank you. 
Have you completed your line yes. of question? Thank Lee McCart. Follow that up, um, Lord Turnbull, you talked about the, the onerous nature of some of these um, the community payback orders or the DTOs, which is again, I think, reflected in what we heard from the previous panel. There's some suggestion um, there that uh, this was creating a pipeline into, the, um, into uh, custodial sentences and that actually a greater use of um, deferred or suspended sentences might be a way of of uh, allowing the, the, the wider supports to be to be brought in to um, uh, help individuals turn their lives around. Is that something that you would again recognise and, and support? I'm not entirely sure because I, I've sometimes heard it suggested that the concept of prison as a last resort is misplaced and, and therefore that uh, if someone receives a community-based uh, sentence by way of disposal, then regardless of what happens with the progress of that sentence, no other form of sentence should ever be imposed. And I, I think that's difficult to, to understand because I think sentencers will tell you that whilst non-custodial sentences work for a significant number of the uh, offending population, they, they don't work for others. And sentencers will have experience of imposing non-custodial sentences with which the offenders do not comply. And whilst they may get a number of opportunities to comply, they still don't comply. Now, the question then is, well, what is the court to do uh, in the end of the day? If somebody is given a community payback order, uh, the, the concept, I would have thought, is that they require to, to, to make restoration to the community for the harm that they've caused to the community. Now, if they simply decline to do that, what is the court to do? Is it to be left with no sanction? Uh, for some, experience will demonstrate that, that simply to say to them uh, that they, they must comply and they must now do uh, more by way, say, of unpaid work in the community than they had first received just, just simply will not work. And I would have thought that if the court has no sanction in the end of the day, in the nature, say, of a custodial sentence, then it's likely that there's, well, there's a risk, at least, that non-custodial sentences come to be portrayed as sentences which are voluntary, uh, and uh, it's a matter for the offender whether to comply or not. And any such perception, I'm, I'm pretty sure, would undermine the confidence which the public had in the use of those disposals by the judiciary. So, yes, I understand that you need to support people who are given non-custodial sentences. But if the court doesn't retain a final sanction, then I think somebody would need to explain to me what it was supposed to do in that situation. I wonder just to that power, before I bring in Liam Kerr, is there any ever analysis of why someone has breached, or is it just de facto breach, and therefore um, a prison sentence is, is um, the, the disposal that must be looked at? There will, in, there will ordinarily be an explanation. Uh, the, the offender will say, for example, uh, I didn't turn up for uh, my unpaid hours of work because uh, I wasn't well that day or, or because something happened. Uh, the person on the drugs treatment and testing order who's found to have a, a positive test for for heroin or something of that sort, will we'll, we'll provide an explanation as to why they relapsed. Uh, but what's the court to do when, when it's hearing the same explanation over and over again uh, from the same individual? Uh, I think that uh, sentencers feel there comes a stage when they just simply are, are looking at someone who's declining to comply rather than someone who has uh, a particular reason for non-compliance. And in your experience, is, is that what's happening, that when someone defaults, every effort is made to look and see, well, was there extenuating circumstances? Could we uh, yeah. suspend this to give them one other chance or, or not? <laughs> well, well I, again, I suspect you might be better informed by the, the sheriffs who, who tend to impose these sentences more frequently than mm -hmm. other judges do. But I, I do know and the Council knows from its combined experience of information from sentencers across the board, that people who fail to comply with the requirements of community payback orders 
will almost inevitably get another chance. They, they will ordinarily get a number of chances, assuming they don't just turn up and say, I, I didn't go because I couldn't be bothered. If they have an explanation, that the court will take account of that. And the court wants these disposals to work. Otherwise, the sentencer would never have selected it in the first place. So I suppose in these circumstances, it is the um, disposal of last resort. To, to come to a... To, to come to a custodial yes. sentence after all these breaches. I, I think that's what will happen. The sentencer will conclude that I've, that I've tried to support this individual. I've tried to give them uh, an opportunity, but they've demonstrated that they're either incapable of taking it or unwilling to take it. So I have to now apply myself to what the sanction is. And of course, in those circumstances, there are two issues. There's not just the fact that the sentence which the court passed for the original offence has not been effective. Mm -hmm. There's also the, the fact that the individual has then breached the orders which the court imposed upon him. So there are two elements to that, perhaps. Thank you. Liam Kerr. Thank you, Convener. Uh, two brief questions for me. In the submission from the Scottish Sentencing Council, uh, it's flagged up that this presumption would cover solemn sentences of up to 18 months, uh, as sentences can be discounted by up to a third due to early guilty pleas. Am I right in thinking this could catch some really serious crimes then? Uh, if so, are you able to give any examples? And could, we have any, could this committee have sight of the data that you've collated on that? Well, the, uh, the Council hasn't specifically collated data on what offences uh, result in what particular uh, sentences. But just for example, as to what kinds of offences uh, will be caught, it, it's for example obvious that uh, offences of assaulting or impeding uh, providers of emergency services or, or police officers will be caught by the presumption because the Emergency Workers Scotland Act and the Police and Fire Reform Scotland Act uh, carry maximum sentences of 12 months imprisonment. Uh, equally, uh, more serious offences uh, could be caught in the circumstances you've identified where an individual pleads to an offence which the sentencer thinks might be uh, appropriately dealt with by a sentence of, say, 15 to 18 months. If that offender has pled guilty at an early stage, then conventionally he, he might expect to receive a discount of a third. <clears throat> so, uh, as you've anticipated, that brings the final sentence down to, say, somewhere between 10 and 12 months, which is right into the teeth of the, the presumption. And offences which uh, might be in that sort of category will include perhaps causing death by careless driving, uh, causing death whilst driving disqualified, uh, indecent possession of indecent photographs of children, possibly even distribution of lower category uh, images, possession of offensive white knives or, or weapons, uh, assaults, uh, and perhaps even in relation to the 15 to 18 month period, some drug supply charges, sexual offences, charges of multiple housebreaking. But the question is then, what, what will the sentencer do? Although, although the, the, the sentence which we're discussing uh, might be uh, attributable to offences of that sort, if the sentencer concludes that uh, the sentence of the court uh, ought to be around 15 months imprisonment and then discounts that by one third uh, to bring it down to 10 in light of the early plea, he will then have to apply his mind to the question of whether or not, despite the presumption, a sentence of imprisonment of that sort still remains uh, the only appropriate sentence. And we'll have to wait and see what individual sentencers decide in that situation. But I would have thought that if the sentencer starts off with the conclusion that a sentence in the region of 15 months is the only appropriate sentence, he's quite unlikely to, to change his or her mind uh, once he applies the discount and realises that he's got to take account of the presumption. Yes, he'll think again, but is he likely to come to a different conclusion? I'm, I'm not so sure. Thank you. Uh, the, the submission talks about one in ten receiving a headline sentence. Uh, and th there's some data there which I think yes. the committee would be interested in. Um, my well, second we, we question. Could you pick that up from the Scottish Government figures? All right. Thank you. Uh, my second question is just around something else that's in there, which. Uh, there's an assertion that it can't be assumed that those who previously 
would have got custody but now get a community sentence would show a similar reconviction rate uh, to those who would currently get a, a community sentence. Could you just elaborate on that point for the committee, please? Well, our thinking there is that in the face of a, a three-month presumption, uh, people who receive non-custodial sentences are, are probably quite likely to be people who are relatively new to the criminal justice system. Whereas at the moment, people who are receiving sentences, say in the region of six to nine months, are, are either pleading guilty to quite serious offences or being convicted of them, uh, or, or are individuals who've probably got quite a history of involvement with the criminal justice system. Uh, and we, we just question whether uh, the rehabilitative effect that we see from one group of offenders is likely to be replicated uh, in, in another. Uh, and in the group of offenders who currently receive sentences of imprisonment of, say, six, nine months, it's very likely that they will already have received a number of non-custodial sentences and probably community payback orders as well, uh, and despite that, have not desisted from offending. Thank you. Fulton. Yeah, you know, I appreciate that we're a really short time. Good morning, hey, or good afternoon, sorry, to the panel. Um, I want to just ask um, if, the, if you could make any comment on the use of electronic uh, monitoring, the various, um, the various sorts of electronic monitoring as, a, as an option to, to reduce short-term prison sentences. Electronic monitoring, uh, <coughs> I, I think, is now available as part of a community uh, payback order, uh, and certainly legislation was in place to, to bring about that option. Uh, so it's a, it's a sentencing tool which will be available uh, to sentencers. Uh, electronic monitoring uh, is really just a, a tool to, I suppose, to ensure compliance in, in relation to a restriction of liberty order. And restriction of liberty orders uh, certainly have the effect of uh, imposing a degree of punishment on an individual, particularly perhaps a younger offender, uh, and also uh, have the uh, ability to, to provide a degree of public protection because, of course, many of the sorts of offences which these offenders become involved with are, are committed at night and a restriction of liberty order can ensure the offender stays at home. Uh, and it may be that as a consequence of the, the change in the legislation which I alluded to, that those orders will become uh, more prevalent in the future. I wonder, finally, if you felt able to comment on the resource implications of the presumption against the three-month sentence mm. currently in place and the proposal to extend that to a 12-month presumption. Well, uh, it's certainly necessary that non-custodial disposals uh, be adequately resourced. Uh, and if Parliament's policy uh, is that uh, more of those disposals uh, should be provided for, then it, it's, it's essential that both the sentencer and the public have the confidence in the robust uh, and effective nature of those disposals. We're not aware, as a Council, uh, of any research which demonstrates that uh, there's an inconsistency in the the use of non-custodial sentences around the country, other than perhaps anecdotally in areas where particular projects are not available. Mm -hmm. I know that one could look to, to certain sheriff courts and say that there seems to be uh, a better or, or a more prevalent use of a non-custodial sentence there than others. But I think one would need to dig a bit deeper to try and understand uh, why that actually was, because uh, Geographical locations will throw up all sorts of differences in offending behaviour, and, and it's not necessarily terribly easy just to compare one with the other. Uh, but, as I say, I suppose principally the concern that sentencers would have uh, is the availability to them uh, of a non-custodial disposal which they can see is sufficiently well resourced to have confidence in. That concludes our questioning. Can I thank you very much for attending today? Thank you. Um, we'll now have a five minute comfort break um, to allow for um, an exchange of wits. No, no, an exchange of
Our next item is consideration of a negative instrument, Title of Conditions, Scotland Act 2003, Rural Housing Bodies, Amendment Order 2019, SSI 2019, Oblique 172. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee has considered the instrument and has no comments. I refer members to Paper 2, which is a note by, uh, by the clerk, and ask mes uh, members if they have any comments or questions. Okay. That being the case, um, is the committee agreed that it does not wish to make any recommendations in relation to the instrument? Agreed. We are agreed. Thank you. Agenda item three is feedback from the meeting of the Justice Subcommittee on, policeman, uh, on policing on 30th May. Following the verbal report, there will be an opportunity for brief comments and questions, and I refer members to paper four, which is a note by the clerk, and invite John Finney to provide that feedback. Um, thank you, convener. As you say, the committee has a feedback note in its papers on the most recent uh, meeting of the subcommittee, which was on the 30th of May, and we took evidence on that day from the Association of Scottish Police Superintendents, the Scottish Police Federation, and the police staff branch of units in Scotland. Uh, regarding the capital funding for Police Scotland, and this was all as part of the subcommittee's pre-budget scrutiny of the 2020-2021 draft budget. And what the subcommittee heard was that the capital budget allocation for Police Scotland was inadequate and that the lack of resources was impacting on the ability of police officers and staff to provide an efficient service. Witnesses stated that the suboptimal sub conditions and equipment were impacting on police efficiency, and that a longer-term capital investment programme was required. The capital budget allocation for Police Scotland is low when compared to other police services across the UK, with Unison describing the capital settlement for this 2019-20 uh, for the forces, quote, a sticking plaster. The subcommittee also heard that while communications with the unions by senior force management and the SPA has improved, there had not been any meaningful pre-budget engagement with them by force management and the SPA. The Scottish Police Federation was also critical of the level of suitable engagement with unions on the policing 2026 strategy, which is a 10-year plan to transform the force. There's a strong feeling that the SPA needs to make a more robust case to the Scottish Government for the funds, Scottish, for, sorry, for the funds that the Police Scotland needs to overhaul its IT, ICT systems and deal with a major backlog of maintenance and replacement of buildings, fleet and equipment. The subcommittee was told Police Scotland is carrying out health and safety surveys across its estate, and this is in addition to the workplace inspections undertaken by uh, the staff associations, and that Police Scotland are doing this in, a, in order to identify maintenance priorities and assess the working conditions for officers and police staff. The subcommittee has requested both it and the police staff association and unions receive a copy of this information when it's available. Available. And the next meeting of the subcommittee will be on Thursday, 13th June, when it will take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Hamza Youssef, on the Scottish Government's response to the subcommittee's report on Police Scotland's use of cyber gears. And this will be the final meeting of the subcommittee before the summer recess. Thank you very much. Do members have any comments or questions? Liam McArthur. Uh, thank you, Convener. It was, uh, I think, as John Finney indicated, a very helpful um, and revealing session. Um, I, I think we all um, I understand that uh, with budgets tight, um, the, the Police Scotland are not going to be the only organisation that come form and, uh, forward with uh, claims that uh, more money is required. But I think the, the standout um, uh, takeaway from uh, the session for me was uh, the suggestion that uh, the SPA uh, are themselves not being robust enough in outlining um, the effect that um, an insufficiency of capital budget is having on frontline policing and policing generally, and, and, and I think that's clearly something we will need to um, keep an eye on as we go into the into the budget process. Okay. Any further comments, Liam? Uh, just on that, as, as someone who's not on that subcommittee, are you able to help me out to understand? Because this is hugely concerning when I was reading this. Uh, and, and uh, recognise the point Liam MacArthur is making about the SPA. So where, where does it go from here? Uh, there are clearly some serious concerns. So how does the subcommittee or whoever's tasked with it follow up on this to make sure that something changes? Through yourself, convener, we are aware that the Scottish Police Authority plays particular attention to the work of the the subcommittee, and, and as I said in my report, we are hearing from the Cabinet Secretary for Justice next week, and we will be putting very strongly these points to him. 
And indeed, that will strengthen his hand, presumably, in negotiations with other, uh, with the Cabinet Secretary for Finance when the budget decisions are to be made. So the, the, we will continue it, and there will be a, that, that will be a matter of public record, obviously. Thank you. If, if I could just concur, it was a concerning, a very concerning to the lease uh, session, and uh, I think the committee was left in no doubt about the inadequacy of the resources affecting the efficiency of the police, especially in the state fleet and vehicle management. And there was a, a very concerning, I think, comment about the lack of transparency in terms of the SPA. Um, highlighting the full extent of the, the problem which raised cell <coughs> health and safety issues. And again, um, I think it was really kind of frustrating and disappointing that the stakeholders all said there was still this lack of meaningful engagement um, <coughs> with them uh, in the pre-budget process. John. Thank you, Kevin. I would concur with that. I, I just need, should correct myself to, to Mr Kerr. It's actually not on that matter we're speaking with the, the Cabinet Secretary on the 13th. I think it's uh, after, after recess, but he will be clearly cited on the, the minutes. Thank you. OK, if there are no further comments, that brings um, us to the end of today's meeting. Next meeting will be 11th of June, when we will continue our consideration of a statutory instrument setting out the Scottish Government's plan on a presumption against short sentences. We'll also uh, continue taking evidence on our inquiry on secure care for children and young people in Scotland. And I now formally close this meeting of the Justice Committee.